say so, Thank you very much. Hello everyone, welcome to my P5. After a long, long time of working, we're here. Um, I'm going to present my project, which is called Architecture for Disaster Relief. Uh, designed a robotic production system for disaster management and relief. So the idea is to explore the possibility of developing design systems, uh, computational design systems, and robotic building systems in order to uh, create solutions which can aim to resettle and uh, bring a relief to natural disasters. So I'm going to briefly go through my research part, I focused on natural disasters that have always caught my attention uh, because from where we come from in Chile, there are a lot of them, so I've always been concerned about how architects or we can act uh, towards this. So this is just quick images that show what is happening nowadays uh, all around the world. So all the circles are natural disasters happening and the kind of natural disasters. So uh, it is a thing that is not just happening in Chile, but it's all around. As I mentioned before, I'm going to specifically be working in Chile, a country which by its geography uh, and climate has all kinds of natural disasters, uh, volcano eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. Uh, and during the past years we have had the biggest uh, events. So in this case, I specifically focused on earthquakes. Um, to understand a bit how an earthquake works, it's the clashing between two different uh, tectonic plates. In the case of Chile, we have three different tectonic plates that are colliding, which makes all kinds of uh, fault types, but also <coughs> comes with uh, land earthquakes and also sea earthquakes. And that brings up the problem. So uh, some years ago, we had one of the biggest earthquakes ever seen uh, or lived, uh, which brought uh, the following question. Uh, there is supposed to be a prevention plan, happens the emergency, uh, there's the, the whole catastrophe, and between the day of the emergency and five days, is still trying to restore the order, and between five days and 90 days, there is no solution. This means a huge amount of population living in the streets uh, with the remains of what they have. And eventually, by this case, a 90 to, let's say, three, four year month, uh, they came up with an emergency solution, which uh, had the end result turned out to be the final uh, settlement or living solution. So. Um, you could see here in a phase of three years how it changed from an emergency shelter to a housing and still today there is no rebuilding of uh, these places. So then I researched a bit in what uh, disaster management is about, so how can organizations work towards uh, reducing or preparing for these disasters, responding to the disasters and also recovering and somehow coming up with plans that reduce the risks of these disasters. The thing with natural disasters, or in general disasters, you cannot prevent them, you cannot control them, so the best way to approach it is having uh, ways to, let's say, deal with it. So we know what's gonna happen, but how can we deal with it? And then uh, comes two big uh, main topics, which is the shelter relief, so the immediate solution what is a natural disaster and what are the different requirements that they have. So we need protection, health, uh, security, community, etc. So I did some research in that. And also what is a settlement, so the bigger picture, what's not just about having a, a shelter, but also we start rebuilding our community or rebuilding ourselves. So throughout the study of a settlement, up here's main requirements has home, security, urban farming, education, health, uh, public spaces, uh, energy supply. So all these are elements that are required to build up a settlement and that we can take into consideration. So how can we prepare, respond and recover to natural disasters? Um, so as I mentioned before in the uh, disaster management plan, there's about risk management, the disaster risk reduction. So how these settlements can also help to reduce the hazard of it. 
and eventually turn to be more sustainable projects. So uh, I start proposing a new uh, timeline, let's say, where we have a prevention phase which uh, is worked with local communities, but also the, let's say, the organization, the national organization for emergencies. There is a very quick period of assessment, so see how much which is damaged, what we can recover, what we cannot recover. Uh, eventually comes from a short period of sheltering, so we give an immediate solution, but eventually uh, there's a recovery process which becomes the settlement. So somehow we don't jump the part of recovery or rebuilding the community. So this way I came up with a multi-scale design to production system. So it has to do with the designing in different scales, which would be the macro, the meso, the micro, which I'm going to go into depth of each of them. But the idea of working on these different scales is that we can approach, uh, let's say, the problem in the different levels, such as a community, which is a macro, or a building process, which is in the micro, and how all of these relate. So as a quick design strategy, there is the idea of understanding the hazard analysis and what are the main programs for the settlement. So sort of have the big picture at once, uh, where we analyze safety, uh, existing evacuation routes, optimizing these routes, allocating the program. So eventually we take this program and we uh, specify and detail the program clusters, uh, optimize it by its environmental analysis, and also start generating the initial geometry. After we have an initial geometry, we go to the next phase of optimizing it for its production uh, by doing structural analysis, <coughs> climate analysis, geometric analysis, and also how it could be produced. Oh, this can look a bit, but it sort of explains these three different uh, scales, the macro, the meso, and micro, uh, which each component, and I'm going to go detailing them uh, shortly goes to a, a multi-production system. So uh, this is a quick, uh, let's say, conceptual idea of how we can approach a prepare, respond, and recover uh, to be able to uh, respond to natural disasters. So there will be a pre-production phase where we create certain elements in factory that are, let's say, in store in case there arrives an emergency. There is a response, so an immediate response, uh, which has an on-site assembly of production. So we already have these prefab elements, let's say. And when the emergency happens, we already know how to approach it, take elements, and start rebuilding uh, shelters in the site. And eventually, on time, a uh, recover, so these shelters turn to be a definite uh, housing unit or a definite uh, school unit. It depends on what program we focus on. A quick initial image of this idea. And this is yeah. So then we go to the meso scales. Uh, remember, I said we have three scales. I'm going to start with the meso because, in my case, was the fundamental part to start. We would be this uh, initial unit. Um, so in this case, from the initial uh, program of a settlement, I decided to focus specifically on the living unit. So let's say uh, sheltering and eventually turning into a housing unit. So I did a study of the different kind of uh, requirements and functions that we needed for uh, a living unit, such as in a basic phase, which would be uh, sheltering. Uh, but eventually how it can grow and integrate power and uh, productive uh, green areas towards it. In this case, also start analyzing the minimum requirements for two to four inhabitants, let's say a small family or a big family, and all these requirements regarding square meters or volumetric. So with this data, we can start inputting it in uh, phone finding <coughs> models. So. Uh, eventually start uh, trying to give a volumetric uh, idea to these different elements. So, for instance, a minimum living unit uh, has a specific minimum volume. We detail the program, so a humid area versus a common area. 
and then how these geometries can start variating depending on its environmental topology, its structural analysis, and also how it can be improved for hazard uh, elements. So this is sort of how in start iterating the different design components uh, towards a final design. So then the next step was uh, sort of I tried to play like a label, so I start combining the different unit elements. Let's say I have an initial living unit and then we add a power unit because, uh, uh, for instance, a solar power unit which can start making it a self-sufficient uh, small shelter. And eventually how it happens if we put all these combined and we have a house or a living unit which is upgraded on time. So that gives this initial, let's say, geometry and its bounding box, which sort of complies with the minimum volumetric requirements that I desire. So then, uh, this volumetric study, we start to uh, try to experiment with the different, uh, let's say, uh, uh, geometry uh, finding in a way to optimize its space. So uh, initially I worked with a more, could say, organic or geometry wrapper structure which had this idea of being cellular but also have a framework, but it turned out to be a bit complex in its uh, fabrication process, especially when we start making this kind of model. So in a second iteration of uh, geometry optimization, came up with this um, voxel or cellular idea of the Voronoi cell which um, Let's say the minimum volumetric study that I had that has a, a packable, let's say, boxes, has this kind of cellular idea, optimized the density, the material requirement, and in a, let's say, in a space where I had one living unit, I could fit three living units now. So the geometry optimizes, uh, let's say, in all aspects for the, uh, for the densification eventually, but also has a, a structural idea and a componential idea, which are going to be discussed later. So in this case, I made a design for initial living unit. Uh, based on the requirements for sheltering, uh, it comes this idea of having like upgradable elements. So let's say that the minimum requirement for a person is closing and bedding, eventually waterproofing and where they can sleep. So then let's say it arrives this initial uh, living unit and then on time it can be insulated, it can integrate climate control systems uh, and it can have a final finishing detailing. So uh, then this idea of a living unit which has sort of uh, pre-made interior elements so you build it up during the emergency and uh, eventually it can be upgraded on time. Then the other part, which we also discussed, so we had the living unit, the other part had to do with the power uh, and the green unit, so how this living uh, unit can start integrating uh, solar energy, also the different uh, water systems, electrical systems, so these are things that are taken into consideration afterwards for its uh, fabrication. Uh, then also how this idea of turning the settlement into a more self-sufficient, uh, let's say, community in a way that after a disaster there is no uh, drinkable water, there is no electricity, so how we can start repowering or rebuilding based on these elements. So uh, then taking into consideration environmental uh, resources such as sun, rain, soil, then we integrate certain high-tech elements as, such as solar panels or water uh, filtering ideas, but also low-tech, like for instance, if they start immediately farming, then they can uh, filter the water and use maybe bad waters for watering, etc. So this also was an idea of integrating different system components into a living unit and how it makes it more circular. Then I had some uh, floor plans, a bit showing this idea of an initial unit, the idea of how, for instance, if this grows on time towards this other unit, so in the design of these uh, cellular uh, components, 
then you can start um, seeing how it grows. And this would be the second floor of the initial unit. So then you see how appears two units. So this is the second floor of the one that we saw before, and then it appears the first floor of the next unit, and then it's the third floor of the next unit. So, and, um, oh, section, we can see it better. So the idea of how these elements already start to integrate all the functions, but also uh, start having different levels, and eventually also how they can grow on time. But this is also a different section. So finally, some images of this mesoscale, which would be the living unit. So a bit shows how these elements are lived in its interior, but also how it can grow on time uh, by this mix between frame and cellular unit, and uh, eventually how also <coughs> they communicate in the exterior and start creating this more like community. Then, going back to the macro scale, let's say we have already figured out how we can give an uh, immediate living solution that could be upgraded in time to end up being a definite living solution, but uh, how does this look in the bigger picture? So the idea of having this uh, cell that can grow um, would apply. So as a case study, as I mentioned before, we're gonna be working in Chile. Um, this was a, a, is a sort of a prediction system which says that the next earthquake is gonna be more in the north side where we already had one. So I decided to work specifically in the region of Coquimbo where uh, we had an earthquake I think three years ago and they also predicted this zone is gonna have. So in this map, uh, let's say this is the initial hazard safety uh, information that we get. So all this area that is in yellow is the hazard zone. So in case of an earthquake or a tsunami, all that area is totally, let's say, lost. Uh, and they also start situating the different uh, evacuation routes. So these are images of the last disaster. So you can see how, let's say, everything is destroyed and gone, for instance, this area, which is also the top area there, of the areas that are considered non-safe. So you can see that the loss is total. Um, then I have the, we have, let's say, the geographical uh, side, start doing some environmental analysis, uh, solar analysis, um, humidity, radiation, etc., which are data that also do work for the input. Uh, then I took a specific section to work on, this idea of uh, building more the community. So initially it comes this idea of evacuation routes. There are starting points where we have the sea, this is the hillside, so in the case of an emergency, authorities start announcing and people start to evacuate. So the idea of designing with this is that at some point we can for instance, this shows uh, the normal evacuation routes, and this is an optimized evacuation route. So how you can evacuate quicker, but also rebuild based on this. Um, then back to the idea of the shelter, uh, sorry, the settlement. We start establishing specific programs. So, and each of these specific programs also has uh, area and the volumetric study. So how they can be applied on a system. And as you see, I consider the living unit as one of, one of the main program parameters, so that's why we are focusing more on this. So based on the environmental analysis and the hazard analysis, we start uh, grabbing these different programs and uh, iterating depending on its depth of height. So let's say this is the C side, this is the top side, and we start allocating these different programs until we get to an optimal uh, allocation based on, for instance, this was the one that I chose where the emergency program is more on the bottom versus the living area that is more on the top. So you build a community that is work safer. So in case of you have to run, we go up, your house is there, and everyone is safe. 
So in the section starts this idea of growing. So we first have the main evacuation route. This is the seaside again. Uh, then the sub evacuation, so how it starts spreading or branching, so it also controls the flow of the people. And eventually we have the allocation of these programs and it starts a volumetric variation based on the different volumes requirement. And then comes this idea of how these volumes start to voxelize or be more cellular and uh, shows also the idea of grow on time. So initially you start with some cells, but then they keep growing and growing and we create a new community. So this is a bit an idea uh, that shows these cells that go growing, the difference between a built cell and the frames, and how they can grow and start building a community. So this is also a quick image that shows this idea of densification. Finally, uh, the micro scale, which would be the building process, let's say. So it comes with a multi-scale production system. So the idea is that we have our unit scale. Uh, the unit has, it's optimized, already designed. Then we have components. The component scale is the building, so how we're gonna build it and make it. So it, the components are optimized based on its geometry and the structural optimization, environmental requirements, etc. And finally, a material scale, so how uh, these are going to be produced. Uh, in this case, along the many, many, many years that I've been in the hyperbody and in robotic building, we have been <laughs> experimenting and researching uh, through different uh, robotic production uh, or fabrication processes such as additive manufacturing, substructive manufacturing, or aggregation. Uh, based on these, uh, let, let's say pre-knowledge, uh, I came up with a design system which includes a pre-production system. So um, let's say what's going to be built in factory. Uh, I also studied the materials that are approachable in the site and are approachable, let's say, in Chile. So basically, are all wood, steel profiles, and let's say all the covering such as EPS, polycarbonates, and uh, steel sheets. And eventually there's also the on-site assembly idea, so how we take this fabrication method to the site and can help building. Why is it so important for me to go or to look the idea of integrating robotics in the building process? It's because um, when an emergency happens, the, the people don't have the knowledge to rebuild their house. The site is very difficult to access, so they cannot uh, bring volunteers to rebuild, so somehow it stays stuck in a process of we cannot do it up ourselves, but no one can come here to help us. So what if we come up with a system that can solve not only the living needs, but also rebuilding as fast uh, as possible. So <clears throat> then comes uh, the unit components. So we already saw the idea of the unit, but then this has a different design and building process. We have an optimized foundation, which is made in factory, a structural framework that responds to the idea of the, you have an initial cell, you have this framework, but then you can grow towards this side. Uh, an interior furniture that is also pre-produced, uh, a component substructure, and then also the ex interior exterior skin. I'm gonna quickly, oh, take you through the different uh, production process of each element. So also they don't have it like a sort of the plug and play uh, system. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, we start with the foundations. The foundations are uh, optimized in its geometry, but also uh, the idea is that the foundation also integrates um, the main connection to the framework. So this idea was to create uh, 3D milled cast elements uh, where you can create the cast the concrete. Uh, so then you have an EPS milling, concrete casting, you integrate the steel joint that is also specifically specifically made. 
um, for the specific cell and then you have an optimized foundation which integrates the vibration dampers so we sort of uh, approach the seismic uh, relation or the seismic importance in the main element. Also the idea of having them as individual is that you can bring them on the side, you put it in and once you go connecting them with the several uh, frames it creates a structural strength. So it's a bit what you can see in the three models also what we like to experiment. In this case comes the idea of an on-site production system. So it's I ah, know, sorry, that was the foundation. So now we go to the structural framework. So the structural framework, uh, the idea is that, let's say the material arrives on site with the local, which is stored locally and we get them locally. And we set up an uh, on-site production system. In this case, uh, as we mentioned before, there is no power, but we could have some kind of generation, energy generator, uh, that can power up this element. Uh, for example, the kite power uh, project um, or some solar panels and uh, can build the system on site. In this case, the structural framework uh, considers all the main elements such as vertical and horizontal uh, structural elements that are connected to the uh, foundations. These elements are specifically designed and let's say tagged and also optimized for the different elements. So as we saw how we could produce the 3D built uh, <coughs> foundations uh, robotically, in this case, uh, rather than a substructive uh, process, it's um, aggregation, let's say like a transformation and aggregation idea, where the robot can go grabbing the elements, uh, it can cut, it depending on its, uh, let's say, angle of connection, and they can go moving it. So, for instance, they grab one, they grab the other one, and then it can either be a person who helps to screw it, let's say, to make it the fastest way, or it could also be a third robot that helps uh, screwing it. So, these are also some references of timber fabrication, robotic fabrication, where it shows a bit the idea of, on how to connect and also work with the gripping <coughs> and giving it. <coughs> structure. Afterwards comes the component uh, substructure. So we have initial frame, but there still is uh, a material necessity for its structural optimization. So then we come up with this idea of a sort of internal structure that can uh, enhance the structure, but also allow the connection of the different skin elements. Afterwards, we also have the idea of an uh, interior-exterior skin, so how these different components start to have a different use. For instance, one could be a solar panel, the other one is just the opening, uh, and the other one is just works like a... In this case, the idea was that you have the panel, sort of the frame, and you have an inner one that integrates the plumbing on electricity system, but also we have an outer layer that perhaps has a tectonic which can respond to an environmental such as rain or uh, sun collection. Uh, finally, there is the interior furniture, which also is the idea that it's pre-produced and it also connects to the same frame. Uh, we're also made out of very cheap or recyclable materials, so it can also give the people the, let's say, the option for them to customize their places, uh, but also in the case that there's no time for it, they can come and have already settled uh, area to live. So this is a sketchy detail, um, which a bit shows the integration of uh, the frame such as in the horizontal, but in the vertical way also. Um, but then the idea of an internal skin, an external skin, uh, which what I was also working on, but did not have time to visualize is this idea of also integrating the systems in it. So more than having a skin that goes like this and like this, it's more an element that can also the fabrication 
process allow to have these gaps where you can either have ventilation or the, system, the electrical system included in it. And eventually the idea of these layers is that they can be uh, upgraded on time. So this was also the idea to show a bit the detail of the foundation and how it has a damper and uh, metal connection that also goes in through it. So, to finalize, and this is five minutes, <laughs> and I'm missing something. <laughs> um, just to round up, uh, comes this question that I've been continuously making, what is next? So, how the demands of a crisis, crisis uh, also represents unexpected possibilities, creating opportunities to work in extraordinary situations, as long as we're willing to do it ourselves. So, this idea of uh, coming up with a design to production system which addresses a prepare phase, a response phase for the emergency, and eventually considers also a recovery, idea of upgrading on time, uh, can, let's say, redefine the timeline of how we are responding towards the emergency, specifically in Chile, and how the idea of not only having local uh, participation and uh, let's say the responsible authorities, but also as architects, we can also start being players in the game to hopefully give better solutions and avoid this idea of having unhealthy shelters that turn to be definite solutions, but have a more uh, low high tech uh, new design. So then the idea of pre-producing has a preparation, uh, an on-site assembly and production system has an immediate response, and then the social or the local customization has a recovery process, uh, builds up a new community or comes up with a solution. So that's um, regarding the presentation. I also did a huge and long work of uh, 3D printing and fabrication uh, experimentation, which also helped a lot somehow. It just looks a little, but uh, the idea of uh, using, let's say, numeric control systems such as a 3D printer or a robot arm uh, gives the opportunity to have a feedback. Let's say the design, once it's printing and you say, ah, oh, it doesn't work by this and this, but then you realize that also as a construction method it's not working, then it reevaluates the design process. So. Uh, this experimentation also was very helpful uh, to see all kinds of details, uh, such as fabrication, but also design process. And uh, yeah, that's everything. Thank you very much. say that, um, as I said, there has to be a, a local participation. So we do have a municipality, for instance, which is located somewhere here. Uh, the municipality has a preparation plan, should consider the idea of having, a, let's say, a robotic factory, sort of, I actually had an image, but this, um, the idea is that it, it, the municipality or the local authority has its own fabrication uh, site. Uh, on site, let's say they pre-produce and they store the elements because we know that eventually it's gonna happen. And also the idea that it's not only for disaster management, perhaps it's social housing, the next uh, stage of social housing, for instance. 
And then the idea is that from here, it happens emergency, and then they can attack locally by bringing these trucks with power generation yeah. uh, and start also the on-site idea. Yeah, but basically if we, if we think that, um, let's say we have a rubble, 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 rubble. Uh, so basically how, how do you envision also the factory could be uh, damaged? Damage, yeah. And also basically the, the <coughs> Basically, I, I still don't understand precisely how this is the ambition at the base of pre-production. Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree. And also, um, let's say in the initial program, uh, allocation, let's say, or the bigger picture, it comes with this idea of a production unit. So uh, we already know where is hazard zones and where is no hazard zones, and we come up with this plan and we say, okay, first, perhaps maybe the first cell that we build is the production uh, factory, and we build it in the top of the mountain. And maybe it's not in the bottom of the mountain. We build it in the top of the mountain has a way that we know that it's going to be able to respond. Uh, it's safe towards hazard, but it's also going to be able to respond as fast as possible. So it is. I think it's part of the plan in the macro scale, how to... Yeah, uh, I was thinking actually uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, MTH with, with this uh, ro mobile robot, right, that actually is probably more able to yeah. uh, go through areas that are not, let's say, not the street. Uh, maybe this would, would have been interesting to Ashwara. also con consider. Yeah. And maybe also um, other possibilities to get the material and the components that you need um, on site. So, um, helicopters, I don't know. So, somehow, basically, being able to uh, yeah. establish this eventually uh, in worst case scenario, um, getting it. Um, and maybe one more thing, if you go to the slide where you show the production on site. Yes, this. Um, <coughs> so you are showing here assembly. Am I correct? Yeah. In this case, the structural framework. So yes, and the assembly on, on the right hand side. Yeah, so it would be like an assembly and uh, let's say a part where you can yes, cut yes, the yes. elements. I I think it's too big basically the vehicle that you have there. So to I think it would need to be smaller again, um, ETH, more yeah. and more able to uh, move to rough terrain. Yeah, also uh, that, well in this case I thought the truck because you could bring the materials, robots and the power supply all on one rather than perhaps bringing smaller elements around. So yeah. and this was the idea, but I agree that it could go further on the, yeah. uh, let's say a response, a you better response. Yeah. You, you doubt further. that could happen in these particular conditions of disaster? It could have, it could be implemented, but with, with other, with another vehicle. So if you would have mobile robotics uh, vehicles, let's say, that would be able perhaps to handle the terrain. But this one, I don't think it would be able to handle the terrain. In, in worst case scenario. Yeah. In best case scenario, yes. So, uh, but otherwise, no. That, and there is some work on that, so which uh, would have been interesting to reference at least. Or yeah. It's probably in the margin. Yes. <laughs> But you can still add it. I think it's very complete and very, very nice to look at it the way it is. So uh, if, if these two, let's say, uh, yeah. would, would be added, basically, would, would be perfect. Thank you. Anyway, yeah. When I upload it, will be. <laughs> then I would like to hand over the next question to Freddy Adama. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, of course, we could have a very long talk, which we're not going to have, um, but 
who do you reflect a little on? Uh, you chose for a certain kind of constructor, okay? Uh, normally, we've got a static way of having standardized uh, units, which on the long term indeed do not provide the, the quality uh, in life uh, which uh, is in, in your model. Yet, uh, standard versus uh, customized. <coughs> but every beam is customized over here. Yeah. So how does it relate? And could you maybe tell something about the speed of building? Because then the constructing that side. Um, an idea. Yeah, no, totally. I, um, so first, um, the difference between, uh, let's say, standard building and non-standard building. I think that uh, this whole project started a bit by the frustration of how standard system responds or not respond to it. So in that sense, I think all this comes up because of that reason. I agree that having a standard panel or a standard element that you just, let's say, populate stacking, either it's stacking on the side or stacking on the top, uh, it's a proof working system. But uh, as shown in the design, initial unit design work, from the stacking idea, you start to reevaluate the geometry uh, into a more cellular uh, idea there proves a reduction in the material and the space, let's say, but it allows a major densification to start. But then has a production part, as you say, of course, having all elements that are totally different from each other, uh, such as in all this, this case, I mean, each foundation is different, each uh, beam is different, each furniture is different. Uh, it is standardized on my computer, <laughs> on the script, but, uh, I agree it takes a bit more time to produce, especially as uh, the research we already have been doing, we can see it. But once it's put on practice, I believe it's a system that can work faster. Uh, then also the idea of using robots is in a way to aid the lack of building force that happens in that time. So there's no way to bring it for a lot of people to rebuild, let's say, communities. So. Uh, the idea of a non-standard building system allows this to rebuild in a faster period of time. So, sort of in the timeline. And uh, at the end, let's say, think a bit how they build the cars. So, somehow the cars also have very customized elements, but they can be mass be produced. So, it a bit goes in this same way, I think. Um, and who is managing the, the building, the construction site? Who's managing? The robot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I think that that's what I was also trying to say at the end. So there's not just a local uh, authority and emergency, but there's also, let's say, a designer or a builder who also is involved in this system. Do you want to hire me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. May I have another question? Yeah. 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 Uh, a, a short one. Okay, then just one short and ask the question. Where is the exodus of the, uh, the circulation system for the drugs? Where is that? The, the uh, circulation system, how do I get into the drugs? Because uh, uh, I know you thought about it, but uh, you did not address it. At least I missed it. So, for instance, in this case, what I tried to show here with the stair exterior staircases, so just because this didn't put in the floor plan, I didn't put them, but uh, let's say you have the, the ground floor unit, but then you also have the top unit, it has its, let's say, built accessible system, but also in this first floor plan, uh, for instance, these are the different cells, but then you can access, let's say, your unit here, and the other one has a staircase that goes up here and accesses the next. Uh, so for instance, in this case, the door is here, so the staircases come from the bottom and access over there and eventually. Okay, I hope that's it. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. that you're proposing and the fact that you're referring to a combination of on-site and 
homicide. It's relevant uh, and it's uh, important. But um, if we only consider this way of uh, fabrication or manufacturing that you're proposing here, probably we are going to be able to build the first uh, layer, or the first uh, floor, and the second floors are not reachable. Because then you have to pre made the whole frame and then use yeah. a crane and then place the, the structure on top of it. So, uh, therefore, I think that this, this, this system is scalable, but it has a certain limit. So, uh, I mean, macro scale design, uh, the way this system uh, of fabrication uh, could uh, give us some hints uh, uh, in, in terms of what is possible and what is not possible can also be explored later and then we can think about it. And with regards to this idea of combination of a truck, which is a very inaccurate, let's say, uh, vehicle and uh, uh, robot, which is super accurate, I think there, in addition to the research by ETH, there is a research by MIT, which actually they're mounting a very small Fuko Aguilas on, on top of a, uh, a crane, and then uh, they, are, they are building larger st structures with that. So I think this combination of uh, dirty and not accurate yeah. and clean and accurate, I think that's that's a, st a strong statement that you are making, but to which extent this is uh, working and feasible, it really depends on the design. Yeah. So By the way, have a look at the how Kong is developing this cable uh, robot and like the cable robots also here in Europe. There is a research group, but in Hong Kong they make they make it uh, very simple uh, so that you really can can use it. So in the sense that again, an, an approach where it's not expensive, it's you can you can three um, D uh, print the parts, you can uh, produce it basically yourself. So yeah, there are so I think you hope you could. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So. If I, if I um, want to like comment based on this, I think I think your your proposal is so clean, uh, it, uh, and it lacks that that level of uh, dirtiness, which which itself can have a certain beauty and uh, aesthetic yeah. and tectonic, which we sometimes uh, see this in our uh, studios. So so I I think uh, you you can later think about it because. Uh, if you go, for instance, to one of your sections, like if you do that now, yeah. So, so everything is so neat, uh, which uh, I don't think this would be the case. Uh, if it suggest, I mean, uh, it, it's it's obvious that you're uh, suggesting the combination of upside and outside, but then. Uh, but also, this could have the time of response. Yeah. That was why. Came up with the idea of the pre-production, like for instance, uh, the foundations could not be made. They could be made, but it would take much more time. So the idea is that you, I don't know, you bring the foundation and just put it in there, and it already has the elements. So I think the idea of having these two systems was more the, the uh, to approach a fast response. Last question. I agree with what Sam was saying because even if you look at the floor, it's straight. While you say that you build it on the mountain, yeah. So, so there are some, some parts are overly simplified, maybe also, and maybe like you know, saying, not dirty enough for the conditions. That I mean, uh, a bit of like maybe grotesque is the, yeah. the not right term. I mean, uh, last question: uh, if if you were if you wanted to build this in Chile. Just as a quick uh, slide, you can say, how would the society there would have received this? Do you think it's going to be something that uh, maybe fit in the context? Uh, I think it will have uh, uh, the societal aspect. a good reception. I mean, if they give you a house, no one is going to complain. <laughs> except <laughs> okay, yes. except that it turns out to be like the case that I showed, which happened a lot. So, I mean, People are are like not thinking 
you know, it's like if I have a place where I can live and it does not filter water, it has a insulation and it has all the furniture in which I don't have to buy, I could go. That's good. <laughs> I, I would live in one of these. Someone see? Huh? Five from people watching. Marco. Should we end this uh, feed now? Speaking of later? Yeah, I agree. How do you say? I think. <laughs>